I'm Katie Plohockey, uh, co-founder and executive director of RG Foods. Uh, we're a nonprofit that serves folks living in um, uh, food deserts. Our mission actually is to enhance the nutritional and economic health of underserved communities by overcoming barriers to healthy food access. So we have programs that kind of touch all across the whole food supply chain. Um, this is our farm where we started and this is our glamping site that we put in last year which will be part of our agritourism package. We have two bell tents. Uh, they sleep about three. We have Japanese futons in there and some furniture and pillows and um, again the this fire pit is awesome. We had some friends of ours built a ceremonial sweat lodge many years ago actually kind of right where that tent was and this is where they would heat these rocks and they would take the rocks in and they they moved to another location but they kind out of the kindness of the heart left the fire pit which is super awesome. Um, so again, uh, we're looking at maybe doing some tiny homes. Um, this will provide a little bit of extra income for the farm. So this is our glamping site. Um, it used to, we used to keep our pigs in here. We kind of built a, a hugel culture all the way around and did fencing. Um, and they just kept escaping. It wasn't strong enough for them, so we moved them somewhere else. So this is what we're doing with the space now. Providing a little sanctuary, overnight uh, trips for people to get away. And be careful, yes, there's, it's very, leafy and there's lots of ropes so pay attention to the ropes that are holding it up but if any if you guys want to kind of walk around and come through we will start meandering because we have 30 minutes to get all the way around the entire space and then you're going to swap with james this is uh, called our kitchen classroom we have a demonstration counter um, it's very close to our hoop houses so we can go pick food and then be able to prepare it here i have some a little tabletop grill that that comes out in the springtime um, this used to be my strawberry patch, but the, the, the cold last year killed all my strawberries, so we're repurposing uh, these beds. We do have a, a hugel culture um, that I'm thinking about maybe putting some blueberries on. And then we just have a lot of herbs and natives all through here. Uh, we do normally, we have a beekeeper that keeps bees out back for us, so we want to make sure we're feeding, feeding the bees. Um, so, and then just natives. For Oklahoma, you know, with the water and drought, they're just much more hardier. They don't need as much water. And they come back every year, perennials. Yay, I love perennials. So this is, and then we have our, all these stools are for people when we do demonstrations, they can move them around, sit in the line, or just move them all over the place. Again, uh, we're gonna be working with uh, youth coming out here for field trips. We also work with Global Gardens. They bring their summer camp kids out. Um, and then working with TPS, youth groups. We also work closely with Women in Recovery in the Lindsay House, so they get to bring their, their clients out with their kids and be able to get their hands dirty and get up, get up some of those uh, microbes that turn on your serotonin and make you happy. Um, so any questions? And I just hired, I'm ex really excited because I just hired two staff members. We've never had staff out here. So it's just trying to keep up with stuff while you're doing everything else. And so Sierra, she has a master's in uh, language and art and is also a teacher and writes curriculum. So she'll be writing all of our curriculum for our kids out here. And then Ashley, um, she's awesome as well. And she brings not only her, her farming, she, she uh, runs volunteer the Tipton Community Garden in Kendall Whittier, but she's also a marketing person. She was the marketing person for the Tulsa Parks Department before they eliminated her position and I got to pick her up. So I'm very excited to have somebody who can also do some marketing for us. So our hoop houses, um, these, I originally built a garden here because we're on rock, we're kind of up on the Osage Hills. Um, the soil was terrible, so I started doing lasagna gardening each year until I could build up that soil. And then I think it was around 2015, we put in the hoop houses. They are a little bit in disrepair. Um, we put the, we bent our own hoops and we put um, rebar and stuck the rebar in the ground. Well, over time, the rebar pushed up into the tube. And now I can't get the rebar out, so we're going to have to make new hoops, unfortunately. And then I have lots of elderberry. I started off small, I had never done elderberry before, and now I realize that they spread and grow really tall, and so I'm gonna move them to somewhere they can really m spread out. So let's see, which direction? Let's go in over the around this way. 
So this little house here was um, uh, my mother-in-law's art studio. And so we've kind of confiscated it from her and we're building a commercial kitchen in there. And then we're also gonna um, just have a place so we can stage for events better and a bathroom and we are working on putting some some outdoor restrooms here so next time you come visit maybe we'll have more restrooms um let's see let's go this way first Thank you. Just get everybody kind of, it's a lot of people to schmush in little areas. Wait for everybody to come over. So this was our original poll first pollinator garden that I put in. Um, so we have lots of herbs and again, lots of natives, um, lots of medicine. We do grow our own herbs for medicine. Uh, Karen, uh, your next stop, Karen's place, she's actually my certified herbo her herbologist, I can't say that. And she takes what we grow and formulates teas, tinctures, and salves. Uh, we put those on the store um, because a lot of times um, our, the folks that we serve can't afford to go to the doctor and so it provides them an alternative specifically with the tea because it's you drink it they can use their EBT in order to buy their tea and then also can help ease their allergies or easy peasy we have a woman's heart a uh, heart medicine a woman's tea um, so, and you'll be sampling some of those here, and then you'll be, get to hear more about what Karen does at her place. So we do grow uh, most of our herbs that we use in our teas, tinctures, and salves. Um, behind you is our asparagus bed, which should be popping pretty soon. I do need to do, get some weeding in there. On the other side of that is our compost bins. We have four compost bins. Um, one of the things that we do in our organization, we do believe in zero waste. And so anything that we may pull from our stores, it's either you know, not sellable like the bananas, they get brown, or, or any of the waste from our kitchen comes over here and we compost it. We used to feed it to the pigs, but we don't have the pigs anymore. So we do a lot of composting here. What prompted the decision to no longer have animal stock? Primarily because my husband and I could never go away at the same time. That's true. Yeah. So um, we, we did it for many, many years and um, it, it, it kind of happened naturally. A friend of ours, uh, our REP provisions, he borrowed all our goats because he wanted to get some of his woods cleared out and he decided he loved them and wanted to keep them. So we said, okay. And then the pigs, uh, right before the pandemic happened, we actually had taken them in to be processed. And then it was like, uh, yeah, you can't get another processing date for like three years. And we're like, yeah, we don't need, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just not have them anymore. Um, and they were really tearing up the ground. Um, this, this used to be fenced off and paddocked and it was just, you know, pigs, they root and make a big old mess. Um, and at that time too, we, were, we had kids coming out here from Global Gardens, like I said before, and other folks. And so we decided again with the pandemic that out, being outside and learning outside is a lot safer. And so we thought we would just turn this into a full-time teaching farm um, and also be able to help uh, the greenhouse particularly. And we have aquaponics too. We just actually moved that out of here yesterday because we're gonna gravel um, the floor is to do plant starts for school and community gardens and then help, help plant starts with the farmers. And then with us too. So we're very excited about that. Do some propagation. Um, we could, eh, let's see, the easy, we'll go back out this way because I don't want anybody to have to traverse down. Um, this is part of the pig damage. There used to be a fence right here and this dirt was sort of the same height as this and they had just dug and dug trying to get up underneath that fence. And so we're gonna kind of create, we've had to do some retaining walls and we're probably gonna do some more over here. Yeah, pig, pigs can be destructive and they would always get out. It's like, I always said they had nothing to do and all day to do it. And if they could find a hole, I'd come home from work and the pigs would be just everywhere. Or they'll make a hole. Or they'll make a hole. Yes, they're very good at making a hole.
So the other side of our compost. Hold on one second. Let's see oh. the other, the other yep. side. And yep, we got the other side of the compost. And then we just have, you know, we, I, I grew cucumbers on this, this last year. Uh, might throw some peas down this year. Um, that bed behind you, that used to be a bed, and then Scott took out a tree and threw that stump there, like right in the middle of my bed. So I need that stump moved. <laughs> Needs to hook the tractor to it and get it out of there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, yeah, it's February on the farm, so everything is a mess and nothing is pretty right now. Uh, we just brought a load of compost in last weekend so we can top off all of our beds and all of our uh, uh, ra raised beds as well. Uh, let's go th this way. It's a little muddy. Scott was out here with the tractor doing some work and got stuck a little bit. This is our raised garden bed. Um, we also have a creek we built because of the water that we have trouble controlling because we're on such a slope. It kind of was naturally making a little, its own little ditch anyways. So we put in this uh, creek bed and pond. As soon as we get our irrigation hooked up and we have some electric run out, we'll be putting a pump on there and we'll be able to pump it up. That other stump, we've removed all of the dirt and it's gonna be positioned so it'll act as a waterfall into the top pond. And again, we want the kids to be able to see what the roots of a tree look like. So it's great to be able to show them that. And we can also do some hydrology education. Uh, we have a, lots of little rocks in the bottom so they can help build little dams and kind of figure out how to make the water flow differently. So we're gonna do some um, hydrology. And then we have just this, this cedar tree was just so awesome. Um, it's just a climbing, I like to climb on it. It's like, oh, this would make a great climbing tree. Um, we're looking at doing um, some solarization and maybe doing some more planting, planting beds just in the ground row cropping, uh, but not this year. We may solarize it and do something with that next year. Um, and then this is, looks crazy. And yes, those cedar trees are upside down in the ground. Uh, my husband likes to do crazy stuff and he wanted to build a platform on the top of that for and a deck to look at. So his engineering didn't quite work very well. Um, so I'm not sure what we're gonna do with that, but it's just an interesting piece, I guess. And then again, we have lots of natives. Um, most of them came from Bustani out in Stillwater. They do wonderful native plants. So this in the summertime is just beautiful. Uh, we have a chase tree, that's a jujube. Um, and then we just have some shelter and a place to sit and we had this fall we had the tractor all decorated up with corn husks and for another little photo op opportunity and in case you didn't know there are photographers that will pay you to bring their clients out and take photographs of them so there's another income stream if you can put a little fancy spot together that looks cute um, so all of the beds are planted just yesterday, actually, we had a big volunteer day out here. Um, I'm part vice president of the Tulsa Urban Ag Coalition, and we have a farmers committee that we meet every month. And then because we all have so much that we need to have done and many hands make light work, we started doing a fourth Sunday farm work day. And so we go out and we try to help find volunteers and then we take them to one of our farms. We switch every month to a different farm and we get stuff done. So last month we went out to Colby Craig's farm and we got all of his fencing put up because he was doing some new fencing. So yesterday folks came out and they helped me put reskin the greenhouse because it, the other plastic had ripped and we wanted to get some new. And they helped move compost and they helped plant. So with, I think we had 17 people for four hours, we were able to really get a lot of work done. And then everybody was really excited and I fed them of course. So we had a big cauldron of, of stew on and we all got to eat when we were done. We do have irrigation run um, all over. We just are waiting for our irrigation tank to come in so we can hook everything up. So we can move, we'll, we'll bypass these folks. <coughs> Uh, they're 
There's not a good way to get over here. I guess we'll just kind of do this. <laughs> yeah, we would have normally went that way. So you can see here, we have water sitting in the swales. And that's exactly what we wanted to happen. So we have one, two, three, four. This is our first swale um, and it has water in it. So we try to capture all the water when it rains in each of these swales. And what that does is it helps keep our trees watered without us having to water. So we're using permaculture practices to, to reduce our water usage. And then again, we have lots of, we, we plant, I plant uh, fruits and vegetables in here. I think I have some service berries. Um, and then again, I have some native grass. And as we continue going and the trees get bigger, we'll probably do some understory planting to kind of create its own ecosystem. Um, we do have weird, we have these stumps that sit in the middle. When we get a lot of rain, they'll, they'll really fill up and the water doesn't go anywhere. So Scott's making, in place of those uh, stumps, he's gonna put a little dam in each one so we can actually lift up the dam and move the water if we needed to. And then we also have line that runs all the way up this middle to the top. So if we did need to put, put irrigation up top, we, we could do that, run the water up top. I think we're going to actually extend this creek bed and put in another pond right where he just stepped into because you can see we have standing water there. Um, we're just trying to figure out, bring out a hydrology guy to figure out how to. Does that water stand even in the summer if it's wet? Yeah. yeah. So we want to keep it, but we don't want it to sit stagnant and breed mosquitoes and get green. So we're really trying to figure out. Um, we're not sure because there's low, you know, this is just shale underneath here. So the water doesn't permeate that. So it kind of stays on the top and just, when we were digging the post for that greenhouse, even though it was dry, 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 we'd get about two feet down and they would start filling with water. We had actually had to use a sub pump to pump the water as we were digging to be able to set the poles. So we need to figure it out. I don't know if we can punch through the shale in spots so it would permeate down in, into the water system. We're going to have to have a professional probably come out and advise us on what to do. Yeah, it's, 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 it's sandstone. Yeah, sandstone. Yeah, it's not ideal. I mean, you're doing it. Working with it though, so we're we trying. Yay, yay. yay! So we have apple trees, pear trees, figs um, in this row. I planted the figs in this row purposely because the house will block the northern wind a little bit, maybe protect them a little bit more. Um, and then we also have, and we'll we'll see that later. Uh, we're kind of creating an event center on the west side, so we actually have an outdoor kitchen, which is what I used yesterday to cook all the food. Um, I did it yesterday because it was supposed to be windy today and I didn't want to have a lot of fires going. We have room to do seven different fires and we use the Francis Melman's Argentina version um, of that. He was on Chef's Table, so if you ever saw Chef's Table, um, he does some really awesome outdoor cooking. So we were kind of modeling our kitchen after him. Um, we did have a big dome um, last fall but in, hung the chickens, but they just weren't close enough to the fire. You'd have to have really big fires, so he actually uh, last week designed, a, you'll get to see it over there, a, what do we call it, spatchcock um, ring. And so we were able to spatchcock the chickens, hook them onto the, onto the cooking grill, and then build the fires in a circle up underneath them. And it worked super great. I was hoping to be able to show you guys, have them on the fire, but it was just too windy this morning to start fires. Would you say his name again, please? Oh, uh, Francis Melman. Yeah, he does some really cool stuff. Um, and then we have, this used to be our barn in the plastic, got all ripped up. And so uh, we're gonna plant uh, a living roof and use that um, kind of as our, our communal seating area when we cook. Um, and that's where we'll be, we'll be sitting today. And then we're working on building, we run electric to that back corner to be able to put a stage. So if folks want to have live music, we can. We've had numerous bands out here. We just kind of build a makeshift stage out of pallets. Um, but one of our, our things for our nonprofit in order to keep this sustainable and also raise funds for our programming is to be able to rent the event space out to whether it's corporations wanting to do an employee day or whether it's a nonprofit wanting to do a fundraiser. We actually did a fundraiser for ourselves last October. Um, and it, we had a lot of, I think we had 70 people out here. 
Um, so just again, how, how can you bring more revenue streams into the farm to be able to make it more sustainable and pay my staff, <laughs> which is labor is always one of the biggest barriers to you know operating a farm and actually making money. Um, Yep, it's the wind. <laughs> it's the wind. And go for it. Okay. So does anybody have any questions? I think we're probably going to be swapping groups here in a minute. And when you ask questions, when they ask you a question, can you re repeat the question? Yes. yes. We, I won't be able to hear them. Okay. Yep. Go for it. So does, is everybody operating farms or growing? <laughs> we have a for-profit farm. Okay. And we're making a profit. Good. Congratulations. That's really one of our, our goals because, um, you know, the, the whole food supply system we look at because um, there's a lot of folks that don't have access to real good food. And that's what our RNG stands for is real and good. Um, so we're really trying to make sure. And in, in some of these areas, like we work a lot here in North Tulsa, where if you live here versus living in South Tulsa, you'll die 12 years sooner. And so we want to be able to, to reduce those, those life expectancy gaps. And there's also a high prevalence of diabetes. We actually work with a program called Fresh RX, and they have 100 people in the program. I have farmers deliver to me at my warehouse, my food hub, and then I deliver it to them. And every two weeks, they provide their patients with fresh grown produce and they've actually they've been doing it in their second year the first year they've seen all of the uncontrolled diabetes levels go down substantially and then also they've saw a large weight loss weight as well in those that were obese so food is medicine and we want to make sure that our farmers have the capacity to not only grow more but to make money a living wage and also be able to get that food into those hands of people who have diet related diseases but no access We've actually used your program as a, as a miniature inspiration for what we're doing on our farm. We have a mobile uh, farm stand. Oh, great. That we take out in the county and service underserved. Farms. That's, yeah, because the, the rural, you know, this is an urban farm, but the rural communities are also having, you know, it's hard. A lot of them don't have grocery stores. Yeah, there's, uh, I think it's uh, 33 counties of the 77 have no grocery store, real grocery store in their entire county. And so actually what I didn't talk to you about is our grocery box, which is coming. We're launching our very first one. We're upcycling shipping containers into self-contained grocery stores that can be set virtually anywhere. Our first one's going in at the Dream Center here, and we're looking at franchising it. We already have three more uh, in the pipeline. We don't want to own them, so we have a Fresh Food Academy where we're, it's an entrepreneurial accelerator program so people can own and operate their own grocery stores in their neighborhoods or in their, in their towns and then we will just be the supplier. Uh, we're also in the middle of a, a feasibility study for a regional food hub here in Tulsa. It'll be finished in June. We have a, a national consultant group that's coming out and um, so we're hoping to actually build a uh, a food system outside of the traditional food system that can help get things to market. And then we can link them and be able to backhaul through the rural communities and either distribute to their grocery stores and also pick up from the farmers that live in those communities. We already have three more uh, in the pipeline. We don't want to own them, so we have a Fresh Food Academy where we're, it's an a entrepreneurial accelerator program so people can own and operate their own grocery stores in their neighborhoods or in their, in their towns. And then we will just be the supplier. Uh, we're also in the middle of a, a feasibility study for a regional food hub here in Tulsa. It'll be finished in June. We have a, a national consultant group that's coming out and um, so we're hoping to actually build a, a food system outside of the traditional food system that can help get things to market. And then we can link them and be able to backhaul through the rural communities and either distribute to their grocery stores and also pick up from the farmers that live in those communities. Hey, welcome uh, to Katie's Tulsa Farm Lab. I'm James Spicer. I own Green Country Permaculture and I run the Tulsa Farmer Incubator here. And she asked me to come out and give uh, folks kind of a explanation of her site and kind of help them interpret it. So that's what I'm here to do. So how's everyone doing? Good. Where, where have you been this morning? Better Day Farms. Better Day Farms? How was that? I haven't been over there yet. Fancy. Cool. And are we from like all parts of the state? Central Oklahoma? Okay. 
Western Oklahoma. Okay, what what are people growing? Like, what's what's your what are your crops? Elderberry. Elderberry. Yep. Okay, cool. Garlic, lettuce, garlic, onions. Okay, so annual crops too. Yep. Is anyone doing tree crops? Orchard. You are. Cool. Um, who else? Raise your hand if you're, uh, anyone else is doing an orchard. Okay, what are, what are you growing? Awesome. Cool. How many, are you doing like an acre or two or? hundred trees? Semi, semi-dwarf trees? Okay. M111. Yeah, good. Okay. What are, what are you doing? Did you raise your hand? Yeah, I just have a small orchard in the vineyard. Okay. Cool. What types of trees? Apples and peaches. Apples and peaches? How long have you been doing that? About 20 years. 20 years? Okay. Well, how are your peaches doing? I mean, well, they did good. They tuned great them all last year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are you in the western part of the state? No, uh, close to Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Do you have to spray your peaches a lot? I sprayed them once. Okay, good. Who else is doing orchard crops here? We just started a small orchard. We just have a variety of things. We, it's only like 14 trees. Okay. So, yeah, Katie, um, if you kind of shift your focus back here, Katie's trying to do an orchard as well. Um, she had a gentleman come in and do um, these, this earthworks here that you see. Does anyone kind of know what the idea behind this is? What is it? Water collection. Water collection and storage. Yeah, who else is, is anyone else doing something like this on their property? We are. For the... Oh, great. Yeah. How long have those been in? Nine years. Nine years? Great. Are they about this size or are they? They're a little wider, but yeah, they're about the same. Have you had to, okay, so um, if you take a permaculture course, you know, you're going to learn about these swells. And the idea is that water runs off the landscape, right? especially in Oklahoma, because we get a lot of our rainfall in a few events, and that rain falls kind of fast and hard, usually faster than the ground can soak it up. And then the rest runs off and it, you know, erodes the landscape and you lose that water. So the, the principle here, or the theory, is that if we put these berms in on a contour line, you know what contour lines are? They're not graded, they're flat. So if I walk along this swell, I'm not going uphill or downhill, it's level, right? Because water will flow downhill, but it won't flow uphill. So the idea is that all this water is running. We're actually in a valley here. Does everyone see this valley formation? You can see the path the water takes. So the idea is that the water hits this berm, and then instead of continuing downhill, it starts to spread out on that contour line, and it fills up with water, and then it soaks into the ground, and then you conveniently have your trees planted along this line to take advantage of that water. Um, like I said, you know, permaculture, people who study permaculture, they'll hear about these systems and they, they, it sounds like a really, really good theory. My experience, we put in a lot of these systems over the past, well, we started over a decade ago. We were putting in a lot of these swells for people. My experience has been that they really don't meet the tree's water needs. Can anyone guess why? Think about when it rains. When, when do, what time of year do we get most of our rainfall? When the, trees don't need it. when the trees don't need it. When it's raining in the spring, precipitation's high, right? Where's evaporation? Is it high or low? It's pretty low because the temperatures are pretty nice. So these swells fill up with a bunch of water in the spring, but the trees really don't need it because the evaporation isn't that low. And then what happens in the summer? Switches low precipitation, high evaporation, and these swells are bone dry. So what we've realized is you still, in our experience, you still have to do conventional irrigation. Do these swells help a little bit? I don't really have the metrics to measure that. I don't know. I do know that these swells create new problems when you put them in, and I'll talk about that just briefly. Does everyone know what happens if you stop mowing, grazing, burning a patch of ground in eastern Oklahoma, what plant communities move into that ground? 
Okay, grasses will start to move in, then what? That's not all, it doesn't stop at Bermuda grass. What, hap what comes next? Yeah, it's gonna be woody plants. What takes over a pasture when you stop mowing it? What, what, blackberries, what else? Yep, sumac, right? Sometimes you'll get Japanese honeysuckle, Chinese privet, Bradford pears, right? So that's called succession. Succession is how plant communities change in a certain place over time. And in the eastern part of the state, we get enough rainfall where a lot of those woody species will start to move in on a patch of ground that is undisturbed. These berms, you said yours were a little wider. Are you able to mow them or? Right. You know, we can't control with exactly. So just like you said, you know, a it's a maintenance problem. So like her, if you if you are going to do these, and I, I still do them for customers to mitigate erosion because they can work very very well to do just that. But if you are going to do these, make them wide enough and soft enough. Soft enough being not acute like that, but soft to where you could actually mow over them. And I know a lot of you folks probably aren't from this part of the state, but if you're ever up in Tulsa, go to Woodward Park and they have some uh, erosion control berms in place, but you can mow right over them. They're wide and soft. Um, because yeah, once you stop mowing this, it's just gonna start moving in. A lot of woody species are gonna start moving in and it's a pain in the butt, right? So we've really stopped using these um, by and large. And one more thing, if you are gonna do these, you need to put in a spillway. I don't know if anyone, if everyone can see this, but do you see this right here? Do you know what happened there? It made its own path. Yeah, the water's coming down and it's, this used to be, a, I mean, it still is a valley. The water's gonna confluence in the valley and then it's gonna have a lot of force coming down the hill. And it basically just wiped out this berm. Can this berm fill up with water now? No, because it's, it's gonna be controlled by the level here. So this berm actually isn't even working right now. So if you are gonna put these in, you put a proper spillway in. Um, I like to use billboard tarp. You know the billboards? I'm sure a lot of you farmers know are hip to billboard tarp. You can buy those pretty cheap. Lay a billboard tarp where you want the water to spill over. And that way the water can go over, but it's not gonna erode the berm down. And effectively, you know, making it to where your swell can't even hold water. These are just berms. A gentleman named uh, E.J. Oppenheimer came and put those in. But like I said, you know, trees, we realize that trees, like in this part of the state, they'll continue to grow, but they won't have good fruit sets if they don't have enough water. And they need that water in the summer. So you're still gonna have to put in an irrigation system. So if you're looking at doing swells, maybe kind of think twice and think if it really makes sense for your application. And a lot of times I've seen some people put in swells in areas that were low lying and wet and it actually made the soil even wetter in the spring and they lost a lot of trees because the trees had wet feet. Um, but yeah, any other questions um, on that? We good? We have an irrigation system and we have a drip line to each of our trees. Yeah. Yeah, so we give young trees like in their first two to three years about 10 gallons per week. Okay. But once they're mature size, it goes up to almost 100 gallons per week. So trees are definitely going to use a lot less water than say like a vegetable garden. But once they're mature, you know, 100 gallons a week really starts to add up. Where do you get your water from? Is it municipal water? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so three times a week at three gallons, that's the nine. So we're close to that. Yeah, you're pretty close. And then, you know, just feeling the soil. So like when I feel the soil, like right now, I know it's going to be good. It should feel, it should feel like a wrung out sponge, you know? And once it starts feeling drier than that, it's probably time to water. Um, so... Let me uh, just grab a close up of you. That. Sorry, I know it's for a... No, it's all right. The soil right now feels great, but in the summer, you know, the soil can get really dry. Hold on one second. Just, uh, just do, just kind of do the thing you're doing. All right, great. <laughs> great. Awesome. All right, you're good. So a lot of people will ask me,
can we water from our dam, right? Um, how would you describe dam water in Oklahoma, like the color and quality? Yeah, I always say it looks kind of like chocolate milk, you know, but that's because there's so many suspended solids in it. And your drip system, ma'am, um, do you have like a disc filter on it to filter out like sediment? No. Probably don't need it because you're on municipal water. If you're on well water, you would need it because there can be sediment in well water. Um, those disc filters grab sediment before it gets to the drip emitters because those drip emitters, if they get sediment in it, they're clogged. Um, and you can have to replace the whole system. Um, pond water or dam water has so much sediment in it that it'll clog that pre-filter up in like a matter of minutes. So it's really hard to use drip irrigation from a dam. So unless you, some people, I've seen a couple clients in this part of the state, they'll put in irrigation dams, but what do they do? They line the bottom with pond liner because all that sediment is from all the crawdads and amphibians and fish at the bottom turning up all that mud. So if you line it with pond liner, you can reduce a lot of that and keep the water turbidity pretty low. Then you can use that water. But yeah, it can be really expensive. Is your water bill much? You said you only have like 14 trees. What's that? I said, I don't know. I don't think about it. Okay. It can get pretty expensive when you're using municipal water. Um, I, I like people, if they have a well or can drill a well, that's the best water source in my opinion. But I had some clients out in Drumright. Um, that's just north of Oklahoma, kind of near Stillwater. Uh, their well water was too saline. We sent it into Logan Labs, and the agronomist there said, hey, you're not going to be able to water for more than a few seasons before your trees start showing you know, nutrient deficiency problems because of the buildup of salts. So we actually are watering from their dam, and it's a system we never tried before, but it seems like it's going to work. Um, they have a dam, and below their dam actually happens to be their best soils on their property, and that's where we planted the orchard. So we actually dug irrigation ditches kind of similar to this, um, and we have a siphon, and we're actually siphoning water out of the dam and filling those irrigation ditches. So you do want to like, if you're looking at using well water for irrigation, you want to test it because sometimes it can be too salty. That'll actually damage your crops. Um, Well, um, so rainwater is not going to have any salts, right? Because it's basically distilled water, but it can have pollution in it. If you live out in the country, it's probably fine. But like if you live near an industrial area, that pollution is in the rain. So there could, there could be some issues there. Um, a lot of people will ask me, we install rainwater collection systems professionally, but a lot of people will say, hey, can't we just catch water off our roof and water all our crops with that? And the answer is like, yes, if you have a lot of money. Because it's not a problem. Like that roof right there, that could fill up 20 to 30,000 gallons of rain water capacity in a season. But who has the money to buy 20 to, 20 to 30,000 gallons of storage capacity? A lot of people will get like maybe a 1,000 gallon tank, 2,500 gallon tank. That's not gonna last you very long, right? And then like we talked about earlier in the summer, it's not raining. So that tank's not gonna refill up for you. So the idea with rainwater collection, if you're gonna irrigate with it, is you gotta catch all the water you need to get you through the growing season in the spring. And that could, buying that amount of storage capacity could be forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. At that point, just dig a well, if you can. Um, Come forward just with yeah. the shadow. The only reason we'll put in rainwater collection systems for folks is if they live off grid and they actually don't have a domestic source of water. And then, we use a lot less water indoors than we use on our crops. So you can, you can get by with like a 5,000 gallon tank if you're a, just like a small single family residence. Yeah, the whole rainwater system like on these wells, when you dig a deeper trench and then, uh, then you add gravel and things to it so it holds water longer and then plant things on top so that you could tap into that later, even lining it later. You know, like Interesting. Do they line them? Yeah. Huh. They just dig it really deep and then they put gravel in it and then they put plants on top that are that it can handle water and then it collects off of the streets and into the rain garden 
and then if you're able to tap into that with a pump even at the bottom of it, sometimes it back up and water itself because it collects natural water. Yeah, I, I guess that could work. You know, trees can't really, most of the fruit trees we're talking about, they can't really have wet feet. Right. So those plants so you're talking about. You could pump a little, a little spaghetti line over to the tree out, yeah. of, out of your reservoir that's in the bottom and yeah. be able to feed. Yeah, I'm sure it could be done. I mean, it sounds like you're basically watering from like a dam, but the dam's just more like a rain garden. Yeah, I don't know how much that would cost. Again, you can get usually get a well for like ten to twenty thousand dollars, and that's an unlimited, almost unlimited supply of water underground as long as you can pump it. So I, I normally tell people to use a well, but that 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 could work. We've done some raid gardens. We never line them. It's basically just a place to detain water and then let it kind of soak in over the course of a few days. Right. Unless you have really clay soil, then it kind of sits there and then you have like mosquito issues. But any other questions before we, um, I think we're gonna break for lunch here pretty soon. Cool. Well, thanks for your time. And uh, I might be around a little bit longer. If you have any questions, just walk up and see me. My company's name is Green Country Permaculture. So we consult with people's properties, help them put in orchards, gardens, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also have what's called a Tulsa Farmer Incubator, where um, we offer like a nine week course and it's like an immersive program for people who are interested in pursuing a career pathway in agriculture. So they come take the course, we go to different farms, we learn about different subjects, like everything from irrigation to food safety to crop planting. Um, and the, they kind of take that course to gauge whether they want to continue with further opportunities. And we, we have a really diverse uh, age range, but we try to get people who are at least 18, and then there's no like maximum age group. But we have 25 people in our cohort. We just had our first class last week, and uh, yeah, it's we've done it six years now. And if you're in the Tulsa area and looking at looking at doing that, we have some people that come as far away as like Shakota. Um, we have scholarships available too, need-based scholarships. So. And then when people graduate from that course, we'll get them like paid internships through grants on local farms so they can keep honing in on their skills in a low risk environment. So yeah, but yeah, thanks again. My name is James and I'll be around if you have any other questions. You're welcome.